Good morning, everyone. Look, I will let, uh, I'll just allow another minute or so before to, to let everyone who is registered uh, join us and then we'll get underway with the presentation. Okay, uh, good morning and welcome to this Australasian College of Road Safety presentation that's uh, brought to you by the New Zealand chapter. Welcome to all of our uh, New Zealand uh, members and our Australian members as well and others who are just generally interested in this very important topic of speed. Uh, today I am delighted to present um, We'll be joined by Anna Bray Sharpen and Caroline Dumas of Waka Kotahi, who have been instrumental in putting the speed management guide together. And they'll take you through the development process, the key principles, uh, the one limit framework and the like. I'll help out on some of the technical aspects. And my co-chair of the New Zealand chapter of the Australasian College of Road Safety, Dr. Rebecca McLean, will uh, moderate the session. Uh, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask as you go through, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and Rebecca will moderate those questions and put those to the <coughs> excuse me, presenters at the end of the session. Um, we have a lot of material to cover today uh, and only 60 minutes to do it. So effectively what we're trying to do today is provide you with an introduction to the speed management guide, which will shortly uh, be released to the industry. Uh, we're going to focus on the guiding approach and principles uh, the linkages with the legislation, the Road to Zero, which is our national road safety strategy and the One Network Framework, cover up the speed management framework, highlight the key changes compared to the current speed management guide and introduce the speed management process, planning process. Uh, the speed management guide includes a lot of other information, including speeds around schools, partnering with Māori and consultation engagement. We simply don't have enough time to cover all of that off today. As you can see here in this figure, uh, Waka Kotahi have been through a significant process over many months in terms of not just developing the content, but engaging with different stakeholder groups. And we are very much going to focus on those first three elements today in terms of the, the principles, uh, how it interacts with the One Network Framework and the development of speed management plans. So look, it's my pleasure now to hand you over to Anna Bray Sharpen, who will take you through the speed management planning uh, context and overview component. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Paul. Kia ora koutou, ke te mihi nui ki a koutou i roto te ahuatanga o tēnei rangi. Uh, e mihi ana au ki ngā tāngata whenua o Whanganui a Tāra, e, e mahi ana au. Um, so, greetings to all of you, and um, I acknowledge the Tangata Whenua, the Indigenous people of um, Wellington, Whanganui Atara, and Aotearoa, New Zealand, where um, I'm speaking to you from today. Um, so, here at Waka Kotahi, the New Zealand Transport Agency, um, we're working really hard to reframe uh, and rethink how we work on um, our transport planning and projects um, and putting Fano at the heart of transport. So for our Australian audience, Fano literally means family. Um, in this sense, it means thinking about putting our people first, our communities first, um, and, and starting to think about all the different ways that we use our roads and streets and planning um, these things together, um, rather than thinking only about how we move people through uh, our road networks. Um, so the part of, um, of this approach that I have been very involved in working on over the past 18 under our road safety strategy, Te Ara Ki Te Ora, Road to Zero. I'm getting messages that I've frozen. Um, can every, everyone else hear me or am I having some connection issues? You're okay now, Anna. I think you just froze very temporarily there for about 10, 10 seconds or so. Okay, sorry about that. I think, unfortunately, it's the meeting room that I'm in. So um, I'll just keep going and then maybe before my next section, I'll try and change to another location. Um, so 
To achieve the vision of Road to Zero, which is um, to have zero deaths and injuries on our um, transport network by 2050 and achieve a, a reduction of 40% by 2030, um, we know that safer speeds are really fundamental um, and they affect how people get can get where they're going regardless of the mode that they're traveling. So we know that um, we need safe speeds, not only to keep people inside vehicles safe, but also to make it safer and more comfortable for people to travel um, in all sorts of ways outside of vehicles as well. Um, so we know that speed is a really um, key element of where the crashes uh, happen at all. And if they do, what the severity level of those crashes are. Um, We've been really good uh, here in New Zealand at telling the story over the last 20 years or so about the importance of um, not exceeding the speed limit. Um, that's something that people very much understand. Uh, however, um, as our understanding of safe and appropriate speeds has changed over time, and we know that we actually need to um, set safe speed limits um, so that people aren't uh, aren't set up to fail inside a system with speed limits that are too high. Um, it's a very new discussion that we need to be having uh, and um, that we're bringing both to the industry and also to the public at the moment about how we actually need to lower those speeds and that's a key element of safety as well. Um, so the next slide please, Paul. Yeah, so as I mentioned, um, this program of tackling unsafe speeds falls into our program of Road to Zero, which is our safe system based um, uh, road safety program. So that program is broken down into five key um, areas of focus. Um, and infrastructure and speed management is one of those. Um, it's a crucial one because it's the one that we estimate will help us achieve about half of our goals. Uh, so it has a really important role to play. Um, Within Road to Zero, we have um, an action plan which has 15 key initiatives for the first three years. Um, the second initiative is um, tackling unsafe speeds. So today we'll be talking about the new framework for speed management, which forms a key part of that. There's also significant activities um, within that around lowering speeds around schools. Um, and we also have a major program at the moment transferring our safety camera program from um, management under the police network to being managed by Waka Hotahi in collaboration with the police. Um, so the next slide, please, Paul. So the speed management guide is a key part of um, this, this whole process. Um, this is the second speed management guide that we uh, produ have produced for Aotearoa. The first one came out in 2017. Um, this one isn't an update. It's actually a completely new guide. Uh, and that's because um, in that time period, so many things have changed, like our one network framework that um, Caroline will be speaking to, like the introduction of a safe system, vision zero based approach to road safety, and like new legislation around how we set our speed limits. So the guide really aims to draw all of these key pieces of information together um, to help uh, both our road controlling authorities develop um, new area based speed management plans, uh, also be a key point of reference for other partners and organisations that have an interest in these topics. Um, and ultimately, it also meets legal requirements under the new land transport rule setting of speed limits around specific guidance that Waka Kotahi needs to um, provide on how to set safe and appropriate speed limits. Next slide. So um, this is a very jam-packed slide, but it sort of presents the, the constellation of strategic documents, um, strategies and policies that sit around the guide. Um, as I highlighted, our Road to Zero strategy and action plan are a really key leading element there. Um, we also have a set of internally um, established strategic directions around sustainability, um, our regulatory strategy and our strategy of partnership with Māori that directly inform um, the development of the guide. And of course, um, key inputs and um, uh, to the guide itself are the one network framework and the setting of speed limits rule. Um, so just highlighting there on the side, those um, target, the vision and the target set under road to zero, uh, that's really the, the starting point for, um, for the way that we've framed the guide and established principles um, to uh, guide our work in speed management. So um, the rule, in this case, it's um, the formal name is the land transport rule setting of speed limits. Um, this is uh, the new rule that I've mentioned. This has been signed and um, is now available to view online. Um, it officially comes into force on the 19th of May uh, and the guide is um, being prepared to come out um, in conjunction with that, maybe shortly after it's in its final phase of approval at the moment. 
Um, so next slide, please, Paul. So the key um, things to highlight about the new rule that really set the scene for how we've developed the guide and where we focus is that um, the rule uh, has been created to really improve and streamline that process of how our road controlling authorities, including Waka Kodahi as the road controlling authority of our straight highways, um, develop, consult on and implement speed management plans. Um, so this is a really big contrast to the current situation, which is um, that most of our speed management planning happens under speed review processes, which take place on a road by road basis. Um, and every individual change has to be consulted on um, independently. So um, this really supports the shift towards a principles based and area wide approach to speed management planning and aims to streamline the whole process of engagement through consultation and implementation. Um, as well as better lining it up with our um, funding site and planning cycles for infrastructure. Um, it addresses some barriers that had been identified to um, implementing um, safe and appropriate speed limits. Uh, and it also um, highlights targets for achieving safe speed limits around schools. So um, in most cases, that will be a speed limit of 30 kilometers per hour around schools, um, which is only the case for uh, less than 10% of our schools at this time. Um, so that's a big, a big task, but a, a really important one for um, getting safer speeds in our communities and, um, and also encouraging um, and providing the opportunity for um, opting for a variety of active modes of travel. Um, so as I mentioned, um, speed management is a key and infrastructure are a key element of Road to Zero. Um, and although they're one, or one element of many different focus areas um, in the program, they have been identified through modeling as the two that combined can um, help us get about halfway towards our target. So it's a really key area of intervention. Um, we have an ongoing program to um, implement 10,000 kilometers of speed management um, changes and a thousand kilometers of median barrier by our initial target um, of 2030. Next slide, please. Great. So um, just to give you some framing for the subsequent discussion, what we've done in this guide is we've started from the point of guiding principles for speed management. We've called these principles, but ultimately this is just sort of an organization categorization of the basic concepts that underpin speed management from a safe system perspective. Um, and, uh, and sort these um, into different areas. Um, these draw both on our own um, national strategies, particularly Road to Zero and the One Network Framework, um, but also on international best practice that um, establishes the safe system thresholds for safe speed limits um, uh, and, a set, um, and the benefits of movement in place and um, taking a system-based approach. So um, we've been engaging on these principles over the past three to four months as we've developed the guide. Ultimately, we've landed on um, a combination of safety, which is how we, we choose the value of our speed limits based on those survivable thresholds under the safe system. Community well-being, which recognizes all the other benefits um, that can be achieved through safe and appropriate speed limits in addition to reducing deaths and serious injuries. Um, making sure that our speed limits connect to the both the movement and place values uh, of our streets and roads, uh, as well as relate to the infrastructure and design that's present. Um, and that our speed limits are supported by um, a broad variety of other speed management activities uh, that wrap around these. Great, so I'll pass over to you, Caroline. Thanks, Anna. So I'm gonna take you through the One Network framework and how that relates to setting safe speed limits. So starting off, what is the One Network framework? So the One Network framework um, is an evolution of our current One Network road classification, which has been in place since 2012. And the, the ONRC, as we call it, was based on volumes of vehicles on the network. So the ONF is slightly different because as well as having movement and volumes, it brings in the place function to the transport network. So like the ONRC, it gives us a common language and we will be, you know, it enables shared and integrated planning. It will improve our decision making and enable better measurement and reporting. And we are in busy embedding the ONF into all systems, tools and processes for the next NLTP, so 24 to 27. A little bit more detail on how um, the ONF contributes to the place element with our roads and streets. So 
It really does represent a shift in how we think about and plan and invest in our transport system by putting people, place and movement at the heart of planning. And because we can do this, we can consider the current and the future function of the network. So it works in conjunction with the network operating framework process. The ONF also has modal layers. So for our multimodal network planning of walking, cycling, public transport and freight. And when you combine all that together, you can really shift the emphasis to moving people and goods rather than just vehicles. So what does this mean in the context of speed management? Um, essentially, using the ONF, we can classify the movement and place functions of our roads and streets to really link and align um, transport with land use, so that integration piece. And as I stated earlier, over the next 18 months, we're starting to align and integrate ONF into wider systems and tools and processes at the agency and beyond into the wider sector to get ready for that 24 to 27 NLTP program. Next slide, please. So if you haven't seen the framework before, um, this is the, the framework itself. It's based on a rural and an urban side of things, which is in accordance with the land use designation. And I'll just briefly explain this to help with what's coming in terms of the technical information. So the place and movement grid, as you can see there, is a five by five, and P1 is your highest place value going through to M1, which is your highest movement value. So starting with the urban framework, civic spaces, you can see the picture in the example there, they are areas that could have um, either very low vehicle movements or, or not, or, or could be fully pedestrianized. So that, he that hence the high place value. Activity streets and main streets, so that's um, your main street going through a small town, for example, um, you know, a, a lot more density, a bit of place and quite a bit of movement in some cases, multimodal activities and some fairly intense land use um, adjacent to the corridor as well. Urban connectors really are that movement based um, network piece through our urban areas, so where you want to specify your movement corridors. And of course, transit corridor is pretty self-explanatory. From the rural context, um, again, movement and place, same, same approach. You just don't have the highest place value that you do with the urban, which is to be expected. So stopping places um, are areas where you need to access off the carriageway, and it might be um, you know, a, a viewing point or something like that, or a significant area where a lot of people park or a, you know, a large truck stop, for example. Interregional connectors, those are predominantly our state highway network in the um, rural environment and going through rural and rural connectors as well. Rural roads can also be, um, you know, uh, not sealed, so gravel in particular. And finally, peri-urban, so where you've got, you know, you might have large lifestyle blocks, quite a bit of access points along the corridor, but it's not in the urban environment, it's designated rural. Next slide, thanks. So. <coughs> excuse me, applying ONF to the guide. What the team have done is you picked up the ONF street category as one of the many inputs to help us determine a safe speed limit range. For example, as you can see there, it could be between 30 to 50, or it could be between, um, you know, 10 and 30. That safe sp speed limit range then becomes one of the inputs into how we calculate a new safe and appropriate speed. Next slide, please. Oh, over to you, Paul. Yeah, thanks, Caroline. So uh, in conjunction with the movement in place, the ONF principles, the other uh, key component for determining safe and appropriate speeds on our network is the SAFE system. And we're bringing together the international evidence to set safe and appropriate speeds at survivable levels for the type of road user uh, that are anticipated on those roads. So. Uh, on roads where there are many vulnerable people moving around on foot and by cycle, that's at 30 kilometres per hour, potentially increasing a little where there is sufficient infrastructure in place to separate uh, those modes, particularly cycling, uh, away from motorised traffic. Uh, and in our rural context, uh, acknowledging the role of infrastructure. So 
New Zealand uh, is now moving to a position where 100 kilometres an hour and above is only going to be acceptable on roads that are median divided. Previously, our, uh, our current speed management guide, which is about to be superseded, uh, adopted more of a risk-based approach, which allowed for 100 kilometres per hour to be uh, identified as a safe and appropriate speed for undivided roads, provided they met certain other risk criteria. So I'll now take you through the uh, speed framework and how it applies in urban areas and rural areas. So you'll be aware of the, um, the ONF matrix that uh, Caroline introduced before. And if I click on the slide, you'll see from a safe and appropriate speed perspective how uh, safe and appropriate speeds transition from higher speeds up in the upper left-hand quadrant down to very low speeds in the lower quadrant. So in those civic space environments, which are highly pedestrianised areas, potentially with no public traffic, potentially service vehicles for deliveries only. They're at our lowest speeds, 20 kilometres per hour or below, and our transit corridors, which are our urban motorways, so still in an urban context, but um, motorway design, they're at our, our, our highest uh, speeds. And in between, we have that transition of where we have multimodal use and roads of differing um, function from a mobility, a movement, and an and a place function. So if I now focus on the lower speed streets, so these are our local streets and our civic spaces, so in the bottom part of the movement to place uh, quadrant. So civic spaces have a speed limit range of 10 to 20 kilometers per hour. Uh, Walker Kotahi have decided that all residential streets that don't fulfill a movement function will have their safe and appropriate speed set at 30 kilometers per hour. So that's quite a significant change from the current guidance, which would have had that set at 40. So adopting more of that safe system principle based approach for our local streets. The next uh, group of categories uh, could generally be called our moderate speed streets. So these are our city hubs, main streets and activity streets. These streets have increasing movement function, but also maintain a very high place function. So they typically are in that upper right-hand quadrant of our movement in place chart. And we've set safe and appropriate speeds here, the limits in the range of 30 to 40 kilometers per hour. And the default uh, safe and appropriate speed for these streets will also be 30 kilometers per hour and we've established uh, parameters that said a higher speed may be acceptable provided certain criteria are satisfied, which typically relate to the provision of infrastructure that would separate out vulnerable road users from traffic, uh, motorised traffic. Then we have our higher speed roads and streets in the urban areas. So these are our transit corridors, which are our urban motorways, as I mentioned before, and our urban connectors, which are what we would typically um, refer to as a, an urban arterial road at the moment. And we know that these ones here are, are, are some of our most dangerous roads in the urban context. They traditionally have relatively high speeds, 50 up to 70 kilometres, 80 kilometres per hour. We're transitioning more to the uh, safe system approach there and specifying a range of 40 to 60 kilometres per hour. And on the next slide, I'll give you an example of some of those criteria. So for urban connectors, this is an example. Uh, the default will be 40 kilometres per hour unless other criteria are satisfied to support a higher safe and appropriate speed. So you can see then uh, there are a range of ways to identify safe and appropriate speed of 50. So for instance, you may well have a road that's median divided, provided it doesn't go through a residential area, that could be 50. Uh, right through to whether a separate cycling facility is provided. And then very stringent criteria for a safe and appropriate speed of 60 to be uh, identified as a, a safe speed limit being median divided, not for a residential area, separated cycling facility and no on-street parking provided. So all of those factors combined creates for that safer um, urban uh, setting. As part of this, we're also looking to improve uh, uh, the safety at intersections along those corridors, so transitioning towards uh, safe crossing facilities and safe speeds at those intersections 
to remove those high risk safety locations along those corridors where higher speeds may be permitted in an urban context. Moving to um, rural roads, so as Caroline said before, uh, we, we retain the, um, the five movement categories, but just have the three place functions. We don't have those uh, extremely high um, place functions of P1 and P2 in the rural context. Very similar um, approach adopted. So uh, where we have our highest movement and lowest place function, we can justify highest speeds, provide certain infrastructures in place. And then as the place function increases and the movement function decreases, uh, we have our, our lower speeds in those areas. So in terms of our connector road network, which are, are our interregional connectors and uh, rural connectors, they're on the um, upper left-hand quadrant of the movement of place matrix. Uh, these have ranges from 60 kilometers per hour right up to 110 kilometers per hour for our interregional connectors. Uh, interregional connectors are typically our state highway network, which um, move significant volumes of uh, traffic and freight between regions. Uh, and as I said before, one of the key principles uh, that is adopted in this version of the guide is to say that 100 kilometres an hour above will only be an identifiable rain, uh, safe and appropriate speed where that road is median divided. Where it's undivided, uh, it will be below 100 kilometers per hour. Here's an example for rural connectors. The default rural connector safe and appropriate speed will become 80 kilometers per hour. Uh, we could justify 100 kilometers per hour if it's median divided and the alignment is straight or curved. Equally, we may move towards a lower safe and appropriate speed where the road if it's unsealed, if the alignment, so the horizontal alignment is tortuous, in which case operating speeds will be uh, around 60 kilometers per hour, potentially lower. Or we have IRR, which is infrastructure risk rating. It's a predictive measure of risk, similar to star rating, um, above a certain threshold, which says, based on our risk uh, uh, approach, we believe that the level of risk that this road has is above a threshold that would be suitable for 80 kilometers per hour. These are the long-term safe and appropriate speeds. So interim speeds of 70 and 90 are still permissible, but they're not considered long-term safe and appropriate speeds. So there'll be guidance, uh, there'll be information included in the guide around that, those transitional uh, speed limits towards safe and appropriate speeds over time, whether or not that's a continuous movement towards a safe and appropriate speed or as a interim lower speed prior to uh, physical works occurring that can then support a higher speed again. Other rural roads, so we have um, uh, the rural roads uh, in the back country uh, that provide access to farms and uh, New Zealand's playground. So these might be sealed or unsealed. Typically, they're going to uh, not have characteristics that could ever support 100, and they're likely to stay on that 60 and 80 kilometer per hour range. And then we have peri-urban roads. These are roads that are rural in nature, but potentially transitioning uh, to urban either through development or they sit on the periphery of an urban area, maybe undeveloped, but um, may have some uh, urban types of activities. They might be used as a, uh, a recreational cycling corridor or may accommodate people uh, going for a walk in, uh, uh, in the, that rural type of environment uh, from a nearby urban settlement. And they have a lower speed limit range associated with them. And the last category is stopping places. So stopping places uh, tend to be places on the rural network where people may want to stop to access uh, an attraction. So it might be a start of a, a walk. It might be a, a viewing area. Uh, it may be a, a school or a marae or just a general area that um, isn't a township. So it's not an urban context. It's just a place that is set aside uh, as, a, as a stopping point and we've introduced this category so that we can have safe and appropriate speeds to accommodate those that, that type of activity that's occurring on the rural road network. So the intent of the guide is that uh, safe and appropriate speeds will be identified for every road in New Zealand and in New Zealand uh, we have a, 
uh, a web-based tool called Mega Maps, which provides the safe and appropriate speed calculations for every road in the country, which is based on all of those input factors that we've presented today. So talking about the one network framework and a range of infrastructure and operating uh, information. The intent is that by 2030, we'll be seeing significant changes on our network, particularly around our schools, because the setting of speed limit rules requires a move towards or best intents that by the end of 2027, uh, we will have safe speeds around all of our schools. But by 2050, longer term vision that all of our network will align with safe and appropriate speed limits across our network. So in terms of what changes under this guidance um, between the current speed management guide and this new one, which will come into force in the coming weeks, approximately 70% of the network will still have the same safe and appropriate speed identified on it as is currently identified. There'll be a, a, around a quarter of the network will have a lower safe and appropriate speed. And the majority of that comes from the, uh, the change in philosophy for our local street networks. We have roughly uh, 12,500 kilometers of local streets that will transition from a safe and appropriate speed of 40 kilometers per hour 30 kilometers per hour. There are other reductions on our urban arterial network and our rural connectors uh, that are also contributing there. And we have a small increase. So around uh, 4,000 kilometers will be identifying a higher safe and appropriate speed than is currently identified. And that's primarily on our rural connector network where we're not taking that fully risk-based approach and we're not looking at crash history to inform those outcomes. So it's taking that principle-led approach uh, so there'll be some roads that currently identified 60 that would now facilitate 80. In terms of alignment between safe and appropriate speeds and speed limits, we currently have a very poor level of alignment at the moment. So 86% of our network has a speed limit that is higher than our safe and appropriate speeds. So in this table, it's that mid middle road, safe and appropriate speeds lower than the speed limit. That's going to increase when the framework gets initiated because we'll have even more lower safe and appropriate speeds, which highlights the need to uh, do more in terms of uh, changing speed limits in the space to align with safe and appropriate speeds. And as the bottom bullet point says, most of the change comes from that increase in the, uh, the change to safe and appropriate speeds in our local streets, so our urban street categories. Uh, and also removing the, uh, the risk-based approach that could permit uh, certain high-speed roads from being 100. So getting to that must be divided for 100. One of the other key changes that we're introducing is the prioritization approach. So inside Mega Maps, currently we identify around 10,000 kilometers of the network on a corridor-based approach, which says, these are the roads where if we make speed limit changes, we can anticipate the best uh, death and serious injury savings from those speed limit changes. We're going to retain that approach um, for high priority corridors. So uh, still retaining those, but we're also adopting more of a network wide based and area based planning approach. So identifying uh, the streets around schools that need to have their speed limits changed to align with the, the new rule. And then also identifying um, streets in high pedestrian areas. So these are areas that have high population density, job densities, um, are in the vicinity of schools, but not immediately around schools and prioritizing those areas. So road controlling authorities can target suburban wide or area wide approaches to changing speed limits. And that approach highlights around 21,000 kilometers of the network, which is approximately one quarter of the network where the safe and appropriate speed is currently higher, uh, is currently lower than the speed limit. So identifying the top quarter of the roads that are out of alignment for prioritization. I'll now hand back to Anna, and she'll take you through the speed management planning process before we get into Q&A. 
Thank you, Paul. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, as we touched upon at the beginning and as, um, as uh, sort of has been reinforced by Paul and Caroline's presentations, we have a pretty significant change now in the planning process um, from a corridor-based approach that required intensive review for every single individual speed change to uh, an overall plan, um, speed management plan-based approach. Um, so this is established under the new speed setting of speed limits rule. Um, and the plan will be the main means by which changes are developed and shared and, uh, and then ultimately certified by Waka Kotahi. Um, so we expect that these plans will consist of a mixture of narrative, um, tables and maps, uh, and the rule specifies a set of key elements that they must contain, and then the purpose of the guide is to draw out those key elements and build out the information and guidance around those um, in terms of what best practice would look like. Um, so the plans have to include a 10-year vision as well as a three-year implementation plan, um, and they need to take a whole-of-network approach, so thinking about the entire area encompassed by the plan, at, um, whether that is at the limit, at the level Level of an individual road controlling authority or as at a regional level as part of a group of road controlling authorities working together. Um, so there's um, three types of plans. There'll be the state highway one prepared by Waka Kotahi, and then there's those two that are just alluded to, either produced independently by a single road controlling authority or as part of a group for, the, for a regional approach. Um, so this idea of the whole of network approach um, presents real opportunities as well in terms of taking an area wide approach to how we change our speed limits. So again, this links, to, links back to what Paul presented in terms of how we've been able to shift our prioritization away from corridor only approach through to encompassing entire um, urban areas um, and areas around schools where we expect a high concentration of people outside vehicles and want to really enable the opportunity for active transport. Um, so um, take, taking a whole of network approach um, means that uh, you can consider particular areas within um, the scale of your network. And something really big there is that we can then look at taking the same approach to, for example, multiple schools or other types of institutions where a lot of vulnerable users gather um, and having one change in speed limits at an area wide level that can benefit all of those rather than constantly needing to drill down to a site by site or street by street approach. Um, Looking at the whole network together is also um, designed to make it more practical to consider not only speed limit changes, but also what infrastructure changes are going to be needed on the network um, and where other speed management activities such as safety cameras um, and design can be best targeted to get the, the greatest um, impacts on, on safety and um, operating speeds in the network um, and best use our limited resources. Uh, so I'll go on to the next slide. Um, so there's a whole variety of roles throughout the process. Um, Waka Kotahi has a role both in terms of um, the regulator um, in which regard the timelines are set around the planning and support and guidance is provided to um, our other road controlling authorities. So that includes the guide, but will also involve a lot of um, work um, and engagement directly with road controlling authorities as they're working their way through those processes. Um, we recognize it's a really big change in the approach and um, we'll have lots of uh, things in play to really support that. Um, as a road controlling authority, of course, Waka Kotahi is responsible for the state highway speed management plan. Um, we then have regional level responsibilities for the transport committees um, who can um, support uh, around developing regional plans and addressing any boundary or consistency issues. Um, facilitated in turn by um, support from the regional council and of course the individual road controlling authorities have the responsibility to either develop an independent plan or work in with a regional level plan. Next slide please. Great so um, there's a lot of detail on here I won't dig right into the detail but Ultimately, as I mentioned, there's three different ways that a plan can, um, or three different types of plan that can be developed. The process is fairly similar for all of them, um, starting, of course, with that initial engagement and development, moving through a more formal consultation process, um, any um, changes or issues that need to be resolved, and then ultimately um, being certified by um, either the director within Waka Kotahi or a speed management committee. Um, committee that has been created to provide oversight to the state highway speed management plan um, and ultimately these plans will be certified and then provided online. 
Um, well, we've touched upon this a little bit. Um, again, just realizing that this is a really big change in the approach. There's a variety of tools that are available now or under development to support the process. So um, also recently introduced as a national speed limit register. So this is designed to be the single source of truth for our um, speed limits in uh, Aotearoa. Um, and all speed limits that are created in, um, and implemented in our speed management plans will need to be input there. Um, Mega Maps is our geospatial tool that Paul mentioned that um, provides an assessment of safe and appropriate speeds for the entire network in Aotearoa, as well as supporting information that might be relevant to wider speed management planning, um, such as um, mean operating speeds um, and crash data. Uh, we are developing a basic template that will um, support the process of certification of the plans by Waka Kotahi. Um, under the rule, there's quite a bit of um, supporting information that would need to be provided. And so we want to make that as easy as possible to submit for certification. And then ultimately, um, we're working towards having a speed management planning um, tool. Uh, for further facilitating the process um, and, and the way that road controlling authorities will need to work through a variety of steps from engagement, development and consultation through until certification. Great, so as I mentioned, we're aware that this is a huge change. Um, we're not just going to be dropping the guide and the rule um, onto the sector and, and, and leaving it at that. Um, so we're working um, in an ongoing way um, as the, uh, the rule is about to go live and the guide will soon be launched, um, both to support our internal staff to make sure we have that skill internally to provide direct support to our road controlling authorities um, and also direct engagement with road controlling authorities and regional um, transport committees, which is going to include a variety of different forums like webinars, drop-in clinics, um, as well as guides and e-learning um, and of course ongoing um, updates to our Waka Kotahi website um, and for all of this of course we're um, increasing our resourcing internally as well to make sure that we can meet the demand for support and information. Um, so these are just a few um, things to highlight. You can now check out the rule online. We have an updated website which is now live. Um, the customer service center can also take inquiries, but the most direct way to, um, to connect in with our program and um, uh, find out about responses to direct queries is to email our, um, our program via the email address provided there, um, and we'll do our best to come back to you with a response. Great. Thank you very much, Anna and Caroline, for that presentation. Um, I'll now hand over to uh, Rebecca, who could uh, take us through any of the, the questions that have been put through in the chat. Thanks, Paul. Thank you to Anna, Caroline and Paul. So we've got some questions come through, so I'm just going to put them um, to the panel. Um, so one of the first questions that come on come through was about engagement. Um, so it's asking about engagement done to date to develop the guide and the principles, but also the opportunity for feedback and engagement. Um, as implementation rolls out? Thanks, yes, that's a, that's a great question. So um, in regard to engagement up until now, we've been working with an external reference group for the past six months, um, taking them through a series of deep dive webinars about the different um, areas of information that are presented in the guide. So working to make sure um, via that group that we're presenting the content that is um, in demand and also going to the appropriate level of detail. Um, so that reference group um, uh, sort of consistently has around 60 to 80 people joining. Um, it is created um, from a representative group of our road controlling authorities um, that were invited to join um, and a few others that um, subsequently ex expressed interest and were added in. Um, it also includes our road to zero partners like the police, um, sector representatives like Automobile Association and the freight representatives, and then a variety of different advocacy groups that have an interest in how our streets um, operate safely, um, such as um, uh, living streets, um, accessibility and um, blind and low vision groups. And those groups were um, basically identified and drawn in via um, the setting of speed limits rule process. So um, they were groups that had submitted on the rule and expressed an interest um, from an early stage. So um, 
that's the group we've been working with so far. Um, there is definitely going to be a process to gather broader feedback once the full a guide goes live. Um, that's really important to us. Um, so the intent there is that um, once the go guide goes live through at least until the end of this year, we will have a process to capture more detailed feedback um, uh, via an online form um, as people are actually um, using and applying the guide um, and we'll also be working directly with specific RCAs um, to gather more detailed feedback. Um, of course if there are, if we identify any direct um, errors we'll make sure those are addressed straight away and then at, um, towards the end of this year early next year we'll be reviewing that overall feedback that's come through and we'll make a call if, um, if we need to do um, updates to the guide overall. Thank you. So we've got other questions on a similar vein around implementation. Um, one around support from the local RCAs and councils around lower urban speed limits, and then an extension of that about um, implementation and support from a political perspective and the challenges of that going forward, I guess, over a very long time frame. Um. Yeah, so the, we, know, we know there are definitely challenges in this area. I'm sure any of you working with changing speed limits will have experienced um, the fact that it's, it's a very polarizing um, matter to, for discussion. Um, we do have a lot of road controlling authorities that are really eager to get started on this. There's a lot that are already working really hard to get those safe um, speed limits uh, in place and are looking forward to this as a process that will really support that. Um, but there's a real spectrum. We recognize that we have real different levels, really different levels of um, resourcing and political um, support for our road controlling authorities throughout the country. Um, and certainly that question of political support, um, it really varies depending on locations. So um, while we see a lot of demand, we also recognize that there is a lot um, of need for ongoing support for our road controlling authorities. So in addition to that direct support in terms of um, developing plans, we also have communications team that is, is, um, is working on wider communications support, both at a, a media and campaign level and also at a direct um, support on, on material um, level for our road controlling authorities. Right. Uh, we've got a question now about the management plans and the alignments with each other. So the state highway and the local road speed management plans um, and around the implementation, the timing between the two different speed management plans and their area that they're covering. So is there any guidance around how that process will work between state highway and local road safety speed management plan alignment? Yes, yeah, so um, the, of course, these two are very um, closely intersected. So there is specific requirements under the rule around um, Waka Kotahi as the um, uh, road controlling authority developing the state highway plan to share that draft with um, local road controlling authorities. Um, but also there is a very strong intention and this is played out throughout the guide as well that um, Waka Kotahi will work directly in, um, in, dis in ongoing discussion and collaboration with road controlling authorities to make sure that those plans complement each other and where possible um, the processes of, of development, engagement and consultation are aligned. Couple of questions around the mega maps. Um, around and access. So at the moment, these are obviously limited access technology. Um, will they be made available for the public um, in terms of increasing transparency? And also for getting community support. Mega Maps, there's not a plan for that at present. Paul, you're probably more familiar with the history of Mega Maps. I'm not sure if you want to speak to that one. Yeah, so in terms of um, accessing mega maps, uh, mega map, uh, access to mega maps, uh, which is a Waka Kotahi geospatial viewer, uh, access requests can go through Waka Kotahi for those. So if you have, uh, if you are from a road controlling authority, that will be um, automatically approved. If you're a consultant uh, and involved in assisting uh, or working on speed management related activities, think that you just need a, um, a note of endorsement or something like that uh, from your RCA and your access will be approved. You don't need to have any special software or anything on your computer. It's just being web-based. Uh, you'll be granted access um, so you get your own 
username and password for that. I believe, Anna, that there, there has been some talk around having a public version of Mega Maps. I don't quite know where that's at in terms of uh, development, but having a um, more of an over, overarching view that can be shared at a, at, with the public to help build that support as well so that they can start to see what the plans are uh, for the whole of the network. And largely that's what the intent of the rule is as well, to produce these uh, 10 year views of how speed limits are intended to change at a regional level so that the public isn't just consulted on a street by street basis, they're consulted at a whole of the network approach. And it says, it's not just my street or the streets that I use that are changing, it's this whole area wide approach. And this is how, this is how I guess the streets that are of interest to me fit in with the bigger picture. And I guess to extend that, that would align with what's happening in this last week with the Sea Rise um, website going live with their maps and the amount of public interest and discussion that's allowed by having that information publicly available. Um, so it's about taking people on the journey. There is a question here in the chat around speed cameras and enforcement. Uh, you briefly mentioned speed cameras and enforcement, but it sounded as, as if they will be used to address site specific um, specific speeding, will cameras strategically also be used area wide and will unsigned mobile speed cameras be still part of the package as they are in Victoria and Queensland and in Australia? Um, I'll give this question a go. My answer is going to be quite general at this point because I'm not um, deeply involved in the camera program. It's been, it's been operating in parallel. Um, but uh, there is more detailed information available on our website and also on the Manatu Waka um, Ministry of Transport website. Um, so the current intent is that um, it's a new approach to safety cameras. It's going to be um, a significant increase in the number of safety cameras that we have operating on our network. Um, and also that we look at other um, approaches to safety cameras um, uh, based on international best practice and evidence of what really works to help lower those operating speeds. So that could be things like point-to-point um, -point cameras or an anywhere, anytime approach to um, uh, safety cameras locate where and where um, people on the network might come across those. Um, there's currently a large program um, under development to work with the police on the transition to camera control by Waka Kotahi and also um, what the process looks like for identifying where those cameras are applied across the network. Um, and over time, we expect that to be more closely integrated with the speed limit setting element of the program. Great. Uh, the question about RCAs that have already completed their speed management plans. Um, do you have any feedback or guidance on the time and resources that have been required and the questions in the context that we need to start programming resources as we move forward with this new speed management plan? Um, that's a great question. Um, I have to admit that I do not. I um, work closely with our area program managers who are the ones that will be working directly with road controlling authorities on developing the plans. Um, and uh, those are the team that at the moment have a much better perspective on the time taken to develop them. Okay, uh, just a couple of question comments about copies of the presentation. I'll just let everybody know that the uh, webinar that today has been recorded, and so it will be put up live on the Australasian Road Safety um, College of Road Safety's website. When I've got links to that in a moment, uh, just checking and in if addition to that, I noted that in the presentation we had a, a couple of um, hardwired links to reference material, so we can uh, share those uh, links. Uh, the, the URLs with everyone as well, so they can go and download those. But if you just Googled uh, New Zealand Transport Agency Speed Management, uh, it will take you directly to the page where all of the, the links and resources can be found. Great, thank you. Now, we've got probably a couple more minutes if there's any other questions to come through. Um, I'm just scrolling through to see what we haven't addressed. Oh, there's a question around the 30K default for urban roads and the progress that's being made in other countries with shorter timeframes than we, what we've got. So Spain with the rollout very soon, Wales for September 23, Scotland 2025. Um, 
and an acknowledgement it's good to see the trend of 30Ks of urban default for New Zealand, but the time scales are long, rather timid. Um, and should 30Ks be set as a national urban default? There's questions about, and there's an, a similar question which I could tie in, which is about the rollout on rural roads and having having the rollout spread over so much so much of a time frame that it makes it confusing potentially and and gets less um, support. Yeah, look, uh, there's certainly been a lot of conversation and debate around whether or not uh, we the, the issue is tackled at a default speed limit uh, approach or if it is uh, done by the rule and through the guidance. Ultimately, the decision was made not to progress down the, um, uh, I guess, the legislative approach to set default speed limits uh, and to support uh, enacting safe and appropriate speeds across our network. There's nothing that would stop an RCA from proceeding more quickly than the timeframes that are outlined here, uh, and certainly that's encouraged. Um, but what we have uh, done in terms of the consultation is identify what are realistic timeframes for change uh, to get to a, a certain stage and for, for gearing up to transform everything to align with safe and appropriate speeds uh, in a vision zero context by 2050. But by all means, if road controlling authorities or regional transport committees have, have a more our ambitious program, then that will be entirely supported. So you can see that through, I guess, Auckland at the moment, uh, they've gone through uh, a number of uh, speed limit change proposals where they've introduced widespread 30 kilometres per hour uh, in their urban centres. Uh, and that's been well received and it's generated some significant safety benefits as well. And that was all in advance of uh, this guide coming out, but aligning with those safe system principles. So. Waka Kotahi and the broader industry are going to be supportive of any regional transport committee or local authority that wishes to proceed uh, at a faster pace than uh, the targets that are set out. Great. Thanks, Paul. And I'm just conscious of the time, so I think we'll wrap up the questions there. But there are emails in the link if people have got further questions they want to direct towards um, the speed, speed management plan team. And I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank Anna, Caroline and Paul for this morning's session. Um, I'm very excited by the changes that are coming and I can see huge potential benefits, not only for safety, but also for accessibility. So I think it's, it's got um, great potential to make a huge difference across the whole network. Now, just before we finish up, I think Paul has shared the slide. Um, I wanted to draw everybody's attention to the fact that New Zealand, the New Zealand chapter of the Australasian College of Road Safety, which Paul and I are the co-chairs of, uh, the host for this year's Australasian Road Safety Conference, and it's being held in Christchurch. So I've got here some details about the conference, its core themes, changing today for tomorrow, with a focus on um, streams, around defining tomorrow, implementing change, innovation, transformation, and prioritizing people. Um, the program's coming together really well. We've got a lot of, uh, a couple of hundred abstracts submitted that we're working our way through at the moment, and a number of key plenary people um, being lined up to present. Registrations are due to open within the next week, so I've put the link there um, for that. And also um, there's a link there, if you're not a member of the college, either in Australia or New Zealand, um, please go, go to the website and look at the information about being a member and the benefits to you of joining a local chapter. Um, and the good thing with the membership, it actually reduces your conference registration as well. So it essentially means the membership doesn't cost you anything for the year with the difference in money that you save. And then just would like to also mention for the New Zealand chapter members who are on the on this webinar, we have our AGM coming up. It's set for the 19th of May. The link is there to register um, and there'll be an agenda and paper documents sent out about that in due course. And once again, there's the link down the bottom if you wanna find out anything more about the chapters, the New Zealand chapter or the chapters in general. And also if you want to um, find out about the membership for the college. So on that note, I will thank everybody for attending today. We've had a really a uh, large group of attendees, which highlights the interest in speed and its importance in our, in our overall vision, Road to Zero. 
Um, and as we said before, the copy of the webinar will be made available um, through the college website. And we may even send it out by a notification of that out to all the registered attendees so you know to go and look for it. Okay, any last comments, Paul, Anna or Caroline? I just thank you. Oh, look, I just want to echo uh, what you've uh, said, Rebecca. So thank you very much to Anna and Caroline for um, uh, gifting us your time today and your expertise and helping share information around the development of the speed management guide. We all look forward to seeing it once that's gone through and received all its internal uh, approvals and as an industry working together to um, bring safe speeds onto our road network and significantly reduce road trauma. So thank you very much. And yes, uh, for anyone that's not a member of the college, please visit the college website, sign up and hopefully see you in person, including our um, Australian attendees at the conference in late September in Christchurch.